I'm from Bangladesh, which is the seventh largest country in the world in terms of population. Uh, there are more Bangladeshis than Russians, just to give a comparison. Uh, it's a big country. Uh, so, for violence to be in big country is not abnormal, it's quite normal because you have so many people. Uh, but uh, when we started to map violence, and what we do is we have something called Bangladesh Peace Observatory, uh, and we got the technical support from the UN, New York. Uh, they supported, I think, six universities around the world, and we are the sixth one, so it's a little bit high tech because it's the latest. Uh, and you can Google now to Bangladesh Peace Observatory and probably it would be number one uh, in the list and you can get in and yourself you can actually roam around and do, to get a sense of Bangladesh uh, violence. We map 26 categories of violence, uh, 26 categories. So all kinds of violence, electoral violence, violence against women, violence against children, slum violence, name any violence, it's there. Uh, it's very difficult to get out of the 26 categories. And then uh, we have over 10 years violence, uh, 10 years data, and so its uh, data volume is now, as I speak, would be more than 190,000. And the UN they had several times it stressed us to see how error free it is and found 96% error free. So when we map violence, uh, it's mainly incidents, injury and death. Now, incidents sometimes may not get uh, recorded, uh, but death is something which is very difficult to hide uh, in an overpopulated country. Particularly Bangladesh is very difficult to hide death. So when it comes to death, I can tell you, it's, the data is very robust. Now, the reason why data and violence is very important is because when policymakers meet, <clears throat> for example, on electoral violence, and I'll try to show you some data on that, <clears throat> uh, sometimes the discussion can be a lot of violence, you know. Like whenever we talk about Bangladesh, the image is there are a lot of violence. Uh, but it is not that much actually. Because if you look at 170 million people, and when you bring down to the per capita, it's, it's quite reasonably, you know, a country with less violence. But that <clears throat> doesn't get uh, flagged. So sometimes I always, um, you know, when it comes to gun violence, for example, uh, it's much safer than New York or Chicago. Uh, but uh, the image is, is very different. Now, it's not only we map violence, uh, along with you know, mapping violence, we bring out peace report, uh, annual reports, uh, peace graphics, but more importantly what we do is we collect micro-narratives. Now that's a different methodology altogether, particularly if you're familiar with collecting or mapping violence in terms of numbers. Micro-narrative is absolutely different. It's mainly we collect life stories. And it's not interview. You just collect life stories, that's it. So for example, in one particular place, maybe in Chemnitz, you have a violence. Uh, what you do, you go to that area and talk randomly to people. It can be a taxi driver, it can be a doctor, it can be an engineer, it can be a student. And after collecting around 400 life stories, and when we talk about life stories, it means real life stories. So you go and just go, first question asked, and the story collectors are trained actually, and mostly they are all students. Because if I, as a professor, if I go and, you know, ask questions, they get intimidated. So it's better for students to get trained the story collectors. And the first question they will ask is, tell me about your childhood. And the fellow is quite excited because nobody comes to him or her 
to know about childhood. So the fellow starts talking about childhood. And then, then the story starts building from the childhood to the youth. And seeing the story collector knows what is his intention, he would then sneak in this question on violence. And did you see violence when during your school time? What kind of violence you see in a college time? your adult time, in the workplace, so sneak in, but mainly you collect life stories. And after you collect 300 to 400 of them, you cluster the commonalities and you cluster also the exceptionalities. And once you cluster the commonalities, you can go and do an FGD if you want to, focus group discussion, and you can also do an FGD on the exceptionalities. That there only one person, out of 400, only one person says something, so you go and find out. Why did that person say something which no one said that? So that gets, when the peace report comes out uh, and uh, all the annual reports, uh, the collection of, numerical collection of data, uh, of the data gets, you know, somehow the combination with, uh, with the micro narratives. So the researchers are of different levels, those who collect, or map violence, they are of one set, but by the time it goes up, um, you have serious researchers looking into the data and looking into the micro narratives and then analyzing. So the policy makers are very interested, and, and we did have a good time uh, in, in many ways with the COVID 19, though it was a sad time, but uh, my center was very much prepared for the pandemic almost because we started. Uh, almost doing everything uh, online, you know, uh, before pandemic, uh, changing data and all. So when the COVID came, with the shutdown and all, we could actually uh, produce the information which even the government really wanted. And this is something that we, it's not flagged, yeah, it's flagged here, COVID-19 graphics. So we had COVID-19 graphics on the social resilience, number of protests, uh, number of incidents, uh, social resilience, you name, you know, uh, anything to do with COVID-19 on the social part was there and we used to bring out in the beginning every week and then every two weeks. And the government knew very well out of our findings whether to open up the shops and industries and all. So we were pretty confident, uh, you know, confident uh, in saying to the policy makers that you can open up with the number of deaths is this much, number of incidents this much, uh, not to mention number of protests is this much, you know, all those things uh, uh, can, uh, one can look into. And it also has a cluster map, if you, as I say, if you, if you get inside, you can also look with it. But I'm not going to waste time. Let me uh, uh, no, get you through some of the things that we bring up, like violence against women. And this is over 10 years data, you can see from 2000, 13 to September 2022, number of deaths in all those years, 7,817. So that gives you an understanding, as I say, death is something which is very difficult to hide. Uh, injuries and uh, incidents may differ, uh, but uh, death that is something that uh, you can be pretty sure uh, that it is quite robust. Now, when you bring them on, on, on scale level, you can actually see the trend. And, and, and this also is very important uh, for the researchers because then they try to see that somehow in 2018 and 2021, it really went up and then it, it, it goes down. So once you know the incidents, you can also see that there, are, there might be some other reasons why it's going up and down. So it's not like it's going up and up and up. up. It's not like it's also going, going, going down. Similarly, on the electoral violence, this is the other thing that uh, normally a developing countries would have, but now even the United States is having electoral violence. But this is also in, in the last 10 years or so, uh, you have 596 deaths, which, which would not be a big uh, issue, you know, in over 10 years. Uh, if, if you look at some of the death figures, uh, from gun violence, for example, every year in the United States, you have 40,000 people getting killed in gun violence. Uh, so you can see the number. So every year, so when it comes to 10 years, 596 
maybe you'll not take it very seriously, but still I think it is important to know about digital violence. And here too also you can see uh, the, the trend, and it went up in 2016, uh, but in 2022, up until now, it, it is pretty low. Uh, it went up again in 2021. So during the election year, it goes up, uh, but then in the non-election year, it goes down. So that also is something that uh, is, is, is interesting to see. Uh, violent extremism, uh, or what is called terrorism in, in, in different discourse, is also something one can look into. Uh, number of deaths in the last 10 years is 219, again, which would not be uh, much uh, when it comes to violent extremism. And in the Global Terrorism Index, if you're familiar with that, uh, Bangladesh should be not in the first, uh, I think now, not even the first 40, I think it's 42 now. Uh, it's not even the first 10, not even the first 20, uh, but violent extremism is, is also something that you have to be careful. You may not be in the first 40, but one incident can, you know, make things upside down. Uh, one good example would be the New Zealand incident, if you're familiar with that, uh, where an Australian guy went to New Zealand and went to the mosque and, and shot some people. Uh, so one incident changed New Zealand. Nobody thought that New Zealand would have a tough time. Sri Lanka also uh, was perfect all right, but after 10 years, uh, they suddenly had one case. So one case can make a difference. So you have to be very careful in analyzing violent extremism because uh, the trend may not uh, give you the right picture. So, data, uh, I don't want to go, uh, you know, uh, into details of all this, but with the Q&A I can uh, come back. But just to give you a sense uh, that you need data to, uh, to make a sense. Uh, you don't have to agree to that, uh, but it's good to have something. And you can question the data provided you also have the data set. It's, it's very difficult you, you can come to the data, of course, you can, you can bring different questions, but to throw away the data completely becomes very difficult unless you have another data set to say your data is wrong. You can say that, provided you have another data set. Now, as we are moving to this tech technology world, and we are more technologicals, so you cannot do without technologies, each of us, we are always using technology. Humans are the only beings who need technologies cows and dogs, they don't need technology, they can just roam around. So since the technology will be there, I, I don't think there is, there is a way out of, of this. But what, what, this help, what helps in having this data outside the mainstream uh, media now is uh, sometimes uh, the media will have its own reasons for flagging one particular incident and making it so big uh, that fear gets into your head, and that's, that's the dangerous part. Because um, once fear, and this is way back in the 13th century, uh, philosopher in the Rouge pointed out that it is intolerance which creates fear, but fear creates intolerance, intolerance creates violence, and that is the end of the equation. So fear is something, I think, if one, if one wants to get out of fear, uh, data is something that uh, would help you, anyway. Thank you very much.